or good afternoon. We want to welcome you to the second half of Crescendo, Psalms 89. Uh, this is finishing book number three uh, in this particular psalm. And if you remember, we left off uh, last time in our lesson in uh, verse number 18. So we want to pick up there, if we may, and let's go ahead and read verses 19 uh, through 24 together, if we may. We're talking out of the book of Psalms, and we're in uh, chapter 89, beginning in verse 19. It says, When thou speakest in a vision to thy holy one, and saidest, I have laid help up one that is mighty, I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, my arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not extract upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. So you'll remember that we were talking about faithfulness the last time we talked, how that God is faithful. And essentially, that's what the first part of this psalm is talking about. And it gave some, uh, some illustrations, some historical facts and so forth as uh, support for that particular thing. So we want to pause just a moment and have a word of prayer as we go further into this psalm now. Father, we come before you thanking you for this day, thanking you for your word. And God, it's not uh, about me, it's about you. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit might be able to take these words and uh, use them uh, to speak to the heart, Lord, that we might understand to a greater degree just how great a God we really have and what you do for us in our lives. We're grateful to everything that you do for us and through us and accomplish in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God's faithfulness is bound up in his promises. The promises of God are firm. They, they're not they're not negotiable. When God makes a promise and when God says, I'm going to be faithful, that's exactly what's going to happen. That's exactly what's going to happen in your life and in mine. One of the things that we forget sometimes when we're in the battle and when we're struggling is, is that God is always present. God never leaves us. He wants, in this time and line that we live in, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us when we receive Christ as our Savior, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in us and through us and working in us, and so we are never left alone. The Bible says that we are sealed by the spirit, the spirit of promise until the day of redemption. What does that mean? Well, that means simply this, that when you and I receive Christ as our personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us bodily from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet and he seals us until that time when we return back again with Jesus. And we have the benefit and the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. We talked about that in the first half, I think. So when he talks about this promise that was made to David that we looked at in several there are several places that it's mentioned in the scriptures, but we looked at uh, uh, that last time, and we talked about that. So God's love for his children never fails, and it never falls short, and is always continually there. And if we can rely upon those promises and wrap our mind around those promises, they will be a source of encouragement for us. Now, he made some promises specifically to David here about those things that were going to take place. Now, if he was going to protect David from the enemy and do all of these things that he said he's going to do in his covenant relationship with David, then it just stands to reason that the enemy's going to attack. He wouldn't have 
made the promises if these were not going to become an issue, if they were not going to be a, a problem for him in his ministry and in his life. So when we talk about these kind of things, we have to remember that when we are the child of God, when we come to know Jesus as our personal Savior, we are going to face difficulties. That is what's going to happen. We are not going to be excluded from a lot of the things that other people go through, but what we will have is we will have an ever-present help in the time of need. Those who do not have Christ don't have that. But we, as God's children, we do have that. We have that opportunity before God because the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. It's a big deal. All right? And so in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came and left. In the New Testament, he's with us. On the day of Pentecost, while they were in the house worshiping there, the Bible says there was a mighty rushing wind and it came in and filled uh, the, the place, filled everybody that was in there that was a child of God, and they, they began to do miraculous works and actually conquered their nation through that power that God had placed in them at that specific time. So you and I, you know, I, I had a person, I've heard this said, and, and it's and it just talking about you and me and where we live, and it's just always been mind-boggling to me. I've heard, I've actually heard pastors say this, the day you get saved, your troubles are over. No, they're not. They're beginning. Because now you have cast your, your faith and promise and trust and entered into a covenant relationship with Holy God, with God Almighty, and Satan hates you. He hated you before, but now he really hates you. And he's going to come after you. But the difference is this. We have the Spirit of God to protect us. And so when you look at this covenant relationship that Jesus had initiated with David, you understand the protective, faithful hand of God on his life. But more than that, on your life as well. God has not a respect of persons. He is no respecter of persons. Listen, what he did and what he promised for David, he promises to all of his children. And so when we are troubled and when we are having difficulty, we need to understand that God is on board. We don't have anything to worry about. Now, he says, I will set my hand also in the sea and in his right hand in the rivers. God extends, in verse 25, uh, our influence and our borders for his glory. We have before God the opportunity to live before him as no one else ever has. If you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 4, uh, and you'll see in verse 9 and 10 the prayer of Jabez. And in fact, I have that coin in my pocket as well. I always carry a couple of coins in my pocket. And one of them is the prayer of Jabez right here. I have it in my pocket. And, and, and so we have this, this written out here. We have the prayer of Jabez here on this coin. And it helps us to understand what it is that God is doing in our lives. And what does that prayer say? In verse number 9 it says, And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldst keep me, from evil, that it may not grieve me, no, and God granted him that which he requested. So Jabez came and cast himself upon the promise and the mercy of God, and when we do that, God takes care of us. He blesses us. He gives us, he increases us. Now, we live in a world today that when we talk about increase and blessing, we're always talking about the monetary side of it, it seems like. How many cars can you have in your driveway? How many boats? How many toys? How many trinkets? How much, how much money do you have in the bank? 
Do you ever have to worry about uh, or struggle with getting a bill paid here and there and, and all of these kind of things? And we, we take this to mean that there will be no financial uh, encumbrances upon us, but that is not what it means. That is not what it's saying. What God is saying is these things may still be with us and we still may struggle, but when it's all said and done, God is going to see us through. When we cast ourselves upon the mercy of God and we, and we place ourselves completely and totally in His hand, He blesses us. He takes care of us. This is why I carry the Jabez coin in my pocket. Not that I might be rich, but because I need the blessings of God in my life. I need God's faithfulness exhibited in my life. I need to do the thing that God needs me to do. I need to be faithful to my God. Well, as you know, all of us struggle with that, don't we? I wish I could say that there's never been a time in my life when I didn't, when I, when I didn't uh, go astray. The truth of the matter is, all of us are sinners. We're influenced by sin, and sin sometimes gets a hold of us. But that's not a tragic end. It just helps us to understand how much more dependent upon God we need to be. Now, if you look at verses 25, 26 and following, you'll see that David is also given not only the promise that God will be with him, but also when things start falling apart in his world, God is going to be there. Look, if you will, in verse number 26. He says, He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy, I will keep him forever. My covenant shall stand fast with him. Listen. God establishes a covenant with us that cannot be broken. We can't break it, and he won't break it. So that covenant relationship is there with him. And that covenant relationship brings us through. In God's eyes, he sees us as forgiven. In God's eyes, he sees us as faithful. You and I know that we need to be forgiven, and you and I know that we're not always faithful. We know that. But God views us from that, from, that, uh, from that light. He says, His seed also I will make to endure forever, and His throne as the days of heaven. If His children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant, now notice this in verse 34, what does God say? What is the promise? My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, that I will not lie unto David. So the covenant relationship remains secure even though we may fall and we may stumble and we may, we may mess up. I remember when I was teaching my children when they were young to ride a bicycle. The first time I put them on a bicycle, I didn't put training wheels on. You said, well, you're a cruel dude. Yeah, well, maybe so. But I wanted them to learn to ride the bike, and so I was their training wheels. We got on the bike, and they rode, and, they, and they, when I thought they had the feel of it, I let them have it. But, you know, they'd go a few feet, and sometimes they'd fall off. And sometimes they'd, I'd say, okay, get back up. Let's go at it again. Let's try again. Let's keep trying until we get it right. And in a few times, they were riding the bike, and they didn't need the, the training wheels at all. They were... They were confident in what they were able to do. But they had to fall to know that it wasn't a permanent issue with them and that they could get up and they could go and they could, they could recover and they could move on. And that's what God does with us. He says, listen, you're going to fall. Listen, you're going to have problems, but I'm going to be there. Did David get everything right? Well, you know he didn't. The sin with Bathsheba, uh, the, you know, the, the murder that, 
that uh, he allowed to happen. That, in fact, he orchestrated and set it up because of his sin, to try to cover his sin. The thing that David did, he did some horrific things. Solomon failed. Solomon became, uh, you know, in his latter days, he, he messed up big time. But you know what? That did not change God's covenant because God was going to put somebody on the throne under the name and under the character and the quality of that throne that was established by God, which David was placed on, but it was God's throne. That's where we sometimes get it wrong. We think it's David's throne. No, it was God's throne that David was placed on until God could inhabit that throne. And someday he will. But loving care includes correction. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5, it says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now you need to check out Job. And chapter 5 and verse 17 in Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 11 and 12. It talks much about the correction of the Lord and the things. And listen, he that is corrected of the Lord is corrected of the Lord. Why? Because God loves him. He's not going to let him just wander off and do those things that are hurtful and will destroy his life without putting some correction, some boundary, some discipline in his life. We, uh, we, we live in a culture today when Nobody wants to talk about discipline. Nobody wants to talk about that. But listen, it's an important issue. It's the proof of your love. Discipline, that's what this says here. Discipline is the correction that you and I need. It says here, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Chasten means discipline. Scourge means to whip. And so sometimes when we are involved in that, we need to understand what it is that God is saying. In Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse 7, it says, If you endure chastening, God dealing with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? And verse 8, But if you be without chastisement, whereof we are all partakers, everybody gets it, right? Then are you illegitimate children and not sons. I don't know how much plainer he can make it. There is reason for correction, which is the fruit, and, and that is actually to make us fruitful and to prove God's love for us. So don't get upset when things don't work out the way that you think they should and the discipline has come your way. Don't let that blow your mind. doesn't mean God's forsaken you. It doesn't mean God has stopped loving you. It doesn't mean you're not forgiven anymore. What it means is you need to learn dependence upon God's word and in God's word so that you don't make those mistakes again, so that you don't have to have the training wheels of life on all the time. <clears throat> now, he goes on in Hebrews to talk about that in verses 9 through 11. But the proof of the love is found in correction and discipline. And again, uh, in the book of the Revelation, uh, it talks about that as well. It talks about as many, in verse 19, in Revelation chapter, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Celebrate, then. Here's the other. Here's what I'm wanting you to see. Celebrate the intense care of the Lord that proved his love for us rather than becoming bitter against him. You know, my dad and mother, my grandparents, I was, I was, I mean, I was an honored kid. I got a lot of whippings, okay? But, you know, the truth of the matter is, I was an honored kid. <laughs> and sometimes it required correction and that's what they do. Now, I don't think it's the first thing the child does. You ought to grab them up and just wail on them. I think you need to, there's a, there's a process to discipline. And God always endures with a process. But the whip is not excluded. 
We have to understand then that God is working in our lives not to make us bitter, but rather to make us better. We need to be better for Jesus. And we can't do this if we do not allow him to work in our lives. He's the, the everlasting dominion that you and I are going to inherit is a resting place for the soul when the soul is at home. In verse 29, he says, His seed will also, I will make endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Whose throne? David's throne. Who's sitting on David's throne? Jesus. When Jesus came, he took on the throne of David, and he became that one that had been prophesied and the type that David ex exercised in his life and the victories he had over his enemies and all the things that went on that were the good things that David did, all of those things Jesus fulfilled completely and totally. So if you ask me today, who is on the throne of David? I'll tell you who's on the throne of David. Jesus is. Da David's throne has an everlasting, eternal person by the name of Jesus, the Son of God, sitting in that place, reigning as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and shall be without end forever. That's what the psalm is talking about. Man, when you think about that, it's really exciting that God is going to be the one who's on David's throne. Someday there will be an earthly kingdom. And guess what? Jesus is going to be on that throne. And we're going to see it. And we're going to celebrate it. In this psalm that we're looking at in verse number 36, it goes on to say, His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as a sun before me. It will be established forever as the moon and as faithful witness in heaven, Selah. In other words, stop and think about that, if you will. Wow, that's something. God promises it, his children abundant life, does he not? Well, one of my favorite passages of scripture, John 10.10. 10. For the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come to give them life and to give it more abundantly. Abundant life. The dominance of Christ in us ruling over sin. Therefore sin no longer rules over us. As we learn in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. And Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. It says God changes our heart by giving us a new heart. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. It says come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. We have those promises that God has given to us that we can live with and we can know that it's true. He's, he takes care of his children. He blesses his children. He gives us what we need. In Matthew chapter uh, 11 and verse 29, it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, in verse 30. And my burden is light. God sustains us even when we are disobedient and willfully resistant to what he requires of us. God never gives up on us. Now we may give up on ourselves, but God never gives up on us. Well, we learn in the rest of this psalm here uh, what God is doing in the life of David and the promises as this crescendo continues to build and the blessings continue to build and the promise of God is on a building platform and we're beginning to see all of these wonderful things that God is doing. And verse 38 says, But thou hast cast off and abhorred, thou hast been wroth with thine anointed, thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant, thou hast uh, profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. Thou hast broken down all his hedges. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. All that pass by the way of spoil him. and He is a reproach to his neighbors. Thou hast set up the right hand of his adversaries. Thou hast made all his enemies to rejoice. Thou hast also turned the edge of his sword. And thou hast not made him to stand in the battle. Thou hast made his glory to cease. 
and cast his throne down to the ground. The days of his youth hast thou, hast thou shortened, thou hast covered him with shame. Selah. So what he's saying here is none of these things apply to what God is doing. But sometimes when we get into the stress, we think God has deserted us. And that's what this psalmist is saying here. He's saying, I, I feel the pressure of God. I feel the weight of chastisement. I feel all of these things going on in my life. This is where I am. I know what the promise of God is. Have you ever had trouble claiming the promise of God? You ever struggled with that? I do. Sometimes the promise of God seems like it's so far away. I say, well, God, if you made this promise, how come it doesn't look like this? Well, because my expectation of what the promise may and should be is not always correct. And sometimes I get it wrong. But this, this part of the psalm, he's breaking away and he's saying, I don't, I, I understand all of these promises. I understand this crescendo, but listen, I don't feel that way. I'm struggling with that. I'm sure glad that's not the end of the psalm. Look at verse 46. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? By the way, God is not hiding. It is we who hide. God is always there. God is in a continuous mode of operandi of revealing himself day in and day out. He has done it from the book of the Revelation all the way back to the book of Genesis, all the way from the book of Genesis, all the way to the book. God has been revealing himself to us, his ways, his things. We need to study his book so we can know what, who our God is about and what he's doing. Remember how short my time is. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall do deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Shall I? We're all going to die. That's what he's saying. Death is the curse of sin. Life in Jesus is the blessing of forgiveness. Why do we die? Because our bodies are decaying. Because things are not always doing like we would like for them to do. We struggle with our bodies. We struggle with our environment. We struggle with so many things. Death is a sentence. Remember what Jesus told Adam and Eve. In the day you eat of that free, you shall surely die. You know what? Adam and Eve died. And everybody after that has died. And are in the grave, except two. And someday in the book of the Revelation, they also will cross through death's door. There is in us the sentence of death. For the wages of sin is death, Romans tells us. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have life in Jesus. We have abundant life. He rescues us. Yes, if the Lord doesn't take us home soon, we're going to all go through death's door. Yes, this body is going to get laid to rest. Yes, this body is going to go back to the elements from which God created it. But one day in that glorious resurrection, God is going to bring life into this body and resurrect this body and bring it back to the place that he designed it to be. So it's not a permanent relationship with, uh, that with us that this death holds us in bondage. It does not. Actually, if you look at it correctly, when we translate from this life to the next, we haven't died at all. In fact, we've just started to live eternally. It's not the end of anything. It's the beginning of everything. And sometimes we get that wrong. Lord, where are thy former kindnesses which shall swear us unto David in thy truth? Remember, O Lord, the reproach of thy servants, how I do bear in my bosom the reproach of thy people, wherein thine enemies have reproached the Lord, wherefore I have reproached the footsteps of thine anointed. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. 
amen and amen. It is not about what we do, which justifies God's faithfulness to us, but what he is accomplishing in us for his ultimate glory that counts. We have struggles, but in the end, we win. At the end, we arrive home. In the end, we have life eternal. In the end, our bodies are no longer under the bondage of sin no, and no longer captivated by sin. And there's coming a time when we receive uh, when we arrive at home when all of that's going to be gone. We often fail in this life, but Jesus never fails. He is faithful to the end. We can count on him. Celebrate God's faithfulness to us. That's what this psalm is saying. The faithfulness of God in spite of all of these things, it's still there. You can count on it. And when it's all said and done, he will keep his promise, he will keep his covenant, and he will see us through. Father, thank you for your word. Bless us as we walk in your ways. God, thank you for being the God that you are. We celebrate you. We're so grateful to just be your children. God, sometimes it's hard, but we have to come to the place in our lives where, yes, we even thank you for the correction that you have afforded to us for our own benefit and our own good. So, God, help us to walk in your ways. Help us to praise and lift you up in spite of whatever else may be going on. Let us offer up praise unto you continually in our hearts and minds because of the great God that you really are to us. In Jesus' name. Amen.